...it's the peculiar effort of the World Championship. Le Mans, always the innovator, has decided to ride a new carbon fiber bike today. This is the kind of risk most cyclists would be unlikely to take in such an important race, but taking risks is what has made Le Mans exceptional. He has inspired Europeans for nearly a decade, and now his story has moved Americans as well. When we return, a look at Le Mans' phenomenal career. Rimtipartimental 520 rises out of the Valley of Grenoble to the Col de la Placette. It's quite an ordinary French secondary road, except that today the winner of the Tour de France is training on it. And that, of course, is American Greg Lamond, author of The Miraculous Comeback. He's also, remarkably, the new great sports hero of France. They say the French are a chauvinistic lot, and a strong argument could be made for that claim. But although Le Mans beat a Frenchman to win the Tour, his story so transcends the trivialities of nationalism that he's revered as if he were himself French. And what an unlikely turn of fortune. And you know, before that, Greg Le Mans was always seen as the winner of the 1986 Tour de France and the American who stole it from the Frenchman Bernard Hinault. Cycling here in Europe has gone on for more than a hundred years. In fact, it started before the auto came along. And it's fair to say that the Victorian attitude has remained for a long time. Greg Le Mans came with an American attitude. He came here purely to win money from professional bike riding. And that was something the European could not understand. He also came along liking to drive fast cars and playing golf in the middle of the cycling season. And above all, he liked eating ice cream. And this was hardly the attitude of a top professional athlete. Then came the injury when Greg Le Mans was shot. And after that, the long fight back when he showed the courage of a top cyclist. After that, his popularity increased enormously. Then came the Tour de France in July 1989, and Greg Le Mans beating Laurent Fignon by just eight seconds. You would have expected a Frenchman on his hometown of Paris would get all the cheers. Instead, Laurent Fignon was booed into second place, and the cheers were reserved for Greg Le Mans, and they could have been heard all across Europe. <laughs> Welcome back, and what a day. I hope you haven't just joined us. But just in case, let me tell you that Greg Lemond has turned the Tour de France upside down today. He has won it by just eight seconds. Bonsoir, la grande boucle est bouclée, 3220 km et des poussières avalées, et le sac final tout à l'heure sur les champs Élysées. mais pour l'Américain, Greg... I can do grease and chomper on some butter and drag him through the garden. No one uh, thought he could make up 50 seconds in just 17 miles. But that's why they have the race, to find out. The world found out today in Greg Lamont, whose career was almost ended by a hunting accident in 87, installed by an appendectomy and a knee injury a year ago, did the impossible. The story of Greg Lamont must begin at the end, when a battered Laurent Fignon finished the 1989 Tour de France, and Greg Lamont had suddenly accomplished something very exceptional indeed. In the beginning, there was little to suggest that the Lamont boy would be exceptional in any way. But under that typical all-American veneer, there lurked an athlete of such dimension and talent. At a time when Americans were grateful to finish international competition and winning was entirely out of the question, Le Monde nonchalantly made history by winning three medals at the 1979 Junior World Championships, a record which still stands today. Such was the meteoric rise of Greg Le Monde. Le Monde became the hottest professional recruit of 1981 and racing with the pros was a dream come true. But when later success was not as forthcoming as he'd hoped, Le Mans felt isolated in a Europe of strange custom and remarkably hostile press. Then in 1983, he realized one of his two lifelong ambitions. After a sleepless night and a bad case of nerves, he hit the big time with a resounding solo victory in the World Championship. With the rainbow jersey draped over his shoulders for a year, Le Mans was no longer a prospect. He was a champion and a marked man. To the casual observer, it seemed a fairy tale, but on closer inspection, it was anything but. There was his first Tour de France, a disappointment because he didn't win, and in his second Tour, he sacrificed his chance for teammate Bernard Hinault. This marked the start of a dark period for Le Monde. Oh, sure, he took the silver medal in the 1985 World Championship, but Le Monde had seen now an ugly side of cycling. He felt bitter, at war with his team, at war with his sport, and perhaps even at war with himself. The lowest point was, paradoxically, the highest point. 
When Greg LeMond won the Tour de France in 1986, he felt so stretched and abused that he could scarcely enjoy winning the most coveted prize in cycling. LeMond won the race, but the war with Bernard Eno and his team, La Vie Claire, had reached fever pitch. If LeMond had felt isolated before, he was now truly alone. In America, though, the situation was entirely different. Le Monde was the obvious golden boy of an invigorated sport. He appeared on morning news shows, made popular appearances, and wrote a book. But just when it seemed Greg Le Monde might be turning a corner in April 1987, his world came crashing down in a flurry of gunshot. Out turkey hunting, he was accidentally shot in the abdomen by his brother-in-law, Pat Blades. And so one of the greatest athletes alive fell in a heap riddled with buckshot. It was as if a great concert pianist had broken both hands. There seemed to be no end to the calamities Le Mans suffered. While on the road to recovery, he was felled with appendicitis. Then later, it was tendonitis. Yet, all this trouble had a strangely healing effect. He moved away from sunny California to Minnesota, where he was more comfortable with the decency of Midwestern manners. Of course, we all know this story has a happy ending. And it's ironic how tragedy has a way of reinforcing life's happier moments. Unlike the yuppies of his generation, Le Monde is not interested in power-mongering or collecting zeros in his bank account. Le Monde's greatest motivation for success, quite simply, is family. Greg's been married to Kathy for nine years, and they already have two sons with a third child expected soon. But whatever his personal motivations, fame and fortune keep coming Le Monde's way. Even so, Le Monde still lucidly recalls that until recently, things were completely different. There were times where I was getting dropped and I couldn't stay with people that uh, normally I could, I, could, I could keep up with uh, when I was in good shape with one leg. So, uh, you know, I had some really hard points in the last few years. And it's weird sometimes that I'd have a little result and my, my attitude would change. And as soon as I felt good, uh, a month later down the road, uh, I felt I was, I had made no progress. Now it's the world championship upon which Le Monde has set his sights. And as always, it is a race he is motivated to win. With the world in Chambry, this is a good opportunity to drop into the Filong Vietnamese restaurant, the closest thing the region has to offer to a good Chinese restaurant like the kind Le Monde knows in Minneapolis. Even in his earlier heyday, it was always said of Le Mans that he could win the big race, but he could never win as many races as the great European champions of old. But feasting over a plate of salad saganaise and prawns in Vietnamese sweet and sour sauce, Le Mans is clearly a changed man. And as the curious look on, it now remains to be seen if Le Mans can continue to impress.